Good evening, viewers. Welcome to another episode of COVID Cast JA. We're at episode 58. Can you imagine? Welcome, welcome, welcome. And today we start the first in a series, Real Estate Investments and Opportunities. Today is going to be a very exciting episode. We have some fantastic experts lined up. So stop right now and make sure you WhatsApp a friend with the link. Tell them to stop what they're doing. This is very important for the investment future. So we're at episode 58. And if tonight is the first time you're joining us, you're saying to yourself, so I missed 57 episodes you did, but they're not gone. It's not lost. Visit our YouTube channel or visit smallbusinessportal.com and you will find all our past episodes, but you will also find our memos because in support of each of our episodes, we have a written memo with information that you can pull up, utilize with your teams, utilize as you're making your business decisions. Please email us at SME, SME at PSOJ.org so that you can be on our mailing list. And this week we have a fantastic memo that was provided to us through Coldwell Banker by one of our experts, Jillian Black. It You need to make sure you download it. I would have print that one too if I were you. And, and ensure that you're not just keeping this information to yourself. Share it with a friend. Because all of us as business people, we're going to be growing and developing and we're going to be emerging on the other side of COVID with stronger businesses. I'm seeing the people coming in. Tassan Spencer Senior, Nadia McCoy, welcome. Terry Ann, welcome. JJ, welcome. Romaine, welcome, welcome. I see Jermaine Selector, J Rod, welcome. Yolando, welcome, welcome. Welcome, everybody, and ensure that you're telling a friend to join because this is a very, very important episode. So we're jumping right into it because we have three guests tonight and we want to make sure that we get pull out all of the information from our guests. So our first guest this evening is a gentleman who is, I'm sure, no stranger to any of you. He is Ryan Reed, the co-founder and group CEO of First Rock Group. He has 14 years of experience in the real estate and financial sectors, eight years at the executive level in the financial sector. He formerly had responsibilities for leading sales, services, accounting, investment, and corporate finance teams. Wow, Ryan. Ryan is a director of multiple private sector companies. He read for his BSc in banking and finance and his MBA in general management with the University of the West Indies and the University of Wales. He also studied at Wharton Business School with a focus on distressed asset, what a thing, a distressed asset investing and a Harvard Business School with a focus on creating shareholder value. He's a member of First Angels Investor Group and the Young Professional Organizations, YPO. He's also a Justice of the Peace for the Parish of St. Andrew. And you're wondering, where does Ryan find time <laughs> to do all this stuff? Welcome, Ryan. This is your first time on COVID cast, but we know it will not be your last. Absolutely, Rochelle. Thanks for having me. And, you know, welcome to your viewers. Yes. So, Ryan, before we get into the real estate investment opportunities, tell us a little bit about First Rock, what your company offers. You know, we've been reading a lot of things about First Rock. You're expanding into Guyana all over the place. Tell us a little bit about what First Rock is all about. So, you know, the First Rock Group is a privately held investment holding company. Mm -hmm. And this company was, you know, started by Michael Banbury and myself roughly about three and a half years ago. And uh, we wanted to create an integrated group of companies that had squared as its focus, real estate and private equity. Believe it or not, this company was started, you know, over a drink of rum at a birthday party. Uh, I don't know if you know Brett Wong. Yes. It was his 40th birthday party. We, you know, we had a conversation at the bar and, you know, you know first what morphed into what it is today. So first rock has interest in multiple entities. There's first our capital holdings, which is a publicly traded entity on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. There is First Rock Realty, which is a real estate brokerage company. And there's First Rock Global Holdings, i.e. First Rock Private Equity, which is a private equity firm. And together, all these entities 
have roughly about 45, close to 50 million US dollars in assets. Um, it operates within about five, almost six jurisdictions, mm -hmm. uh, over 70 employees. And um, we're very proud of the company, uh, you know, with respect to where it has, you know, what it has achieved in, in such a short space of time. Yes, and it really has grown in such a short space of time. Yeah, we give thanks. Yeah. We give thanks. And you know, for many persons, um, seeing that there was a focus on real estate, they weren't necessarily wrapping their minds around um, this 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 investment. You know, and investing in first track. Um, yes. <clears throat> why the focus on real estate because i know many of our viewers are saying so we should be focusing on real estate why yes. focus very on good question russia very good question so you know having been in the financial sector for so many years what i what, what i came to realize or i mean i've come to realize is that there are many persons who primarily when they think of investments they primarily delve into you know trade of the securities and you know markets go up and done, you know, and with first our capital holdings, which, one, which is one of the entities we have an interest in, we wanted to create an entity where persons could participate in a company which has a square focus on real assets, oh. right? So assets which are not at the, you know, behest of, you know, markets going up and down daily. And, uh, you know, the truth is as Jamaicans, and as Caribbean people, when we think of real estate, we think of buying a home. Yes. That's the reality. So we say, okay, listen, we get an education, we you know, get married, buy a home, and you know, pay a mortgage, and that's it. But mm -hmm. we never really zoned in on real estate as a business. And there are many who have been doing this for many years. And we said, how can we create an entity that allows persons to get that exposure to real estate. And guess what? I may have just, you know, 10,000 Jamaican dollars. I may be contributing to NHT, but I can't even qualify for an NHT loan. But I still want exposure to real estate. Yes. You can buy the first or capital holding stock. And that's how you get the exposure. So we want to want it to be, you know, create a, 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 a culture of inclusion for the average Caribbean national to, to participate within this space. Yes. And, and it was very interesting because, um, as you said, when we think of real estate investment, we are more focused on buying our first home. And then we see how we can buy another home after we sell the first home. But this is now a vehicle for us to actually participate as investors in the real estate market. Yes. So tell me a little bit now, in terms of real estate development. Yes. Um, inquiring minds want to know, asking for a friend. We see a lot of developments going on around the place, Ryan. And mm -hmm. we see we said, but we're not in a COVID. COVID are key. People. And we thought that um, things would have actually pulled back, but we mm -hmm. actually more and more developments happening i mean are the properties being sold what, what's what's happening in the real estate market so i mean just from a just from a technical st well a fundamental standpoint i should say when you think about it interest rates are low mm -hmm. so financial institutions need to be more creative with respect to how they deploy their capital right so and you know for your viewers how they spend the money Right. And so when you when you look at it this way, if I'm able to earn as a bank one or two percent, it makes sense for me to lend at six, seven, eight, nine percent. And so what is happening in the marketplace from where I sit or from where we sit as a company is that the providers of credit are still very bullish. So when you see this development going on, this high rise going on, don't be like, OK, well, this person has all this money. No, no. This person can qualify for a mortgage. Um, and, as, and, and, and to the extent that, an, that, that a financial institution is willing to extend credit, we will continue to see that buoyancy and that boom in the real estate sector. Okay. So, so we shouldn't be looking at this buoyancy with a sense of skepticism to say this is not sustainable. 
this this um this buoyancy in the real estate market and investing in real estate this is something that we're actually going to see much more growth over time we expect so 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 the truth is once you know we still have that sort of you know employment levels that still very comfortable and once the financial institutions are still you know willing to so willing to extend that credit then fine mm -hmm. but if that should ever change then you know we may be in for problems okay and we noticed that um first rock actually is invested in actual developments yes <laughs> we saw you breaking ground recently yes. can you tell us a little bit about that part of the business yeah, so first drop capital holdings um which is one of the entities we, we we you know from day one we said listen we're not a real estate investment trust we're not simply acquiring property for income mm -hmm. you know we wanted to do everything real estate we wanted to take an entrepreneurial approach towards real estate investments and so whether it be property for income whether it be property for capital gains whether it be real estate developments we wanted to do everything uh, we have developments here in Jamaica. We have developments in, in Costa Rica. You know, we have properties that we've acquired for capital gains and for onward sale. We have mm -hmm. properties that we hold for rental income. Um, you know, in Jamaica, the Cayman Islands, Costa Rica, the United States, and um, you know, soon to be you know Guyana. So yeah. we wanted to really make money out of the business or out of real estate, I should say. And, and not just taking a, a sort of, um, you know, not. In yes. You want to the yes. Yeah. yeah. So, in terms of, can you tell us from where you are sitting from that investment perspective? Mm -hmm. What are you seeing as those trends in the market? We have a lot of micro, small, and medium um, business owners mm -hmm. who are not going to say, hmm, maybe I should be looking in this way. You know, I was I was thinking more of downsizing, but maybe yes. this is a, a way that I should be looking. What kind of tips, what guidelines, what you seeing happening that you want to share with our viewers? What I'm seeing is really more agility, you know, among businesses. Um, obviously, I mean, you know, due to the you know onslaught of COVID-19, but also more creativity on the on, on the on the part of you know the creators of the product so i believe gone are the days when you'll see a massive commercial development you know with five six seven thousand you know space per office you'll see more you know confined spaces you know spaces that allow and foster that sort of agile working space you know, persons who will come into office at 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. and so forth. That's sort that's that's sort of change in dynamics, you know, with where we stand. But do I do I think that this will continue? I don't know. You know, yeah. we're still in uncertain waters. And the, the truth is that we just need to constantly do an assessment of the marketplace and ensure that we're delivering the product that persons will will will, will gravitate towards. Okay. So if, if somebody invests in a company like First Rock that is focused on real estate, mm -hmm. um, so say me have mm, $100,000. Mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> I come to First Rock. What, what is First Rock doing with my money? What, what kinds of investment is happening with my money in First Rock? Because I know, you know, we, we know how to put money in at a bank and we know about the bonds and things. Mm -hmm. But are, these are new investment opportunities that we want our viewers to understand what's going on behind. Yes. So, I, I mean, we, again, when, when, when Michael and I, you know, really started this entity, we wanted to create something new to the market. And we decided that diversification will always be our main tool. So diversification with respect to income segment and diversification with respect to jurisdiction allocation, right? So we said, how do you make money out of real estate? There may be like four or five ways. We want mm -hmm. to touch every single one. But then are we concentrated in Jamaica? No, because that's how you minimize your risk if you diversify away. So we're in... We're in five, almost six countries, and we're effectively diversified across all these jurisdictions. So if, you know, Russia takes uh, $1 million, 
and says, you know, I'm going to buy some first stock shares, then effectively she is a part owner in first stock capital holdings, which has real assets in five countries. Yeah. You know, so, you know, we, we are very proud of that approach. And I, I think if you look at our results, then, you know, it will, it will, it will indicate that, you know, it's working well. And, you know, Ryan, just, just, and, and viewers, I'm seeing your comments coming up and I'd actually love you. Please send in more questions. So we're going to go to some of the comments, but Ryan, First Rock was started, what, about two, three years ago. So you yes. effectively started as a micro business. Absolutely. <laughs> that has grown over time. And I think it is important that our viewers actually see businesses grow, like real life businesses grow. Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. you just give us just a little picture of, of that growth from a micro business in this sector to where the company is now? Yeah, so, you know, we spent, so the business is three years old. We spent roughly a year planning, you know, you know, organizing. So, you know, the core team, which includes my partner and myself, we met every single Sunday, effectively, um, you know, putting things in place. And then what we wanted to do was, firstly, capitalize the company. So we capitalized the company with, you know, personal resources, and then we decided that, for first our capital holdings, the first main entity focused on real estate, we wanted to do a private placement. You know, we, we went to, you know, financial institution and the financial institution, I mean, um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time putting things together. The financial institutions, at, at, that financial institution at, at the night, I would say, listen, boy, you know, it's a startup, you know, we don't want to take that risk. Okay. And listen, we're out. You know, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? And, you know, luckily, you know, you know, Cygnus Capital at the time stepped in, you know, and they, at the ninth hour as well, stepped in and said, listen, we will arrange a transaction for you. And they have been a saving grace, you know, for us. Um, you know, that being said, we raised 18 million US dollars on a private placement. And we said, you know, we are going to list on the main market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange within one year of operations everybody said we could not do it like everyone said rochelle we could not do it and i said listen i'm doing this and we listed after 10 months we raised 13 and a half million us dollars took us to roughly a little over 30 million dollars in capital or money um in less than in less than a year and you know what? We listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange in February of 2020. Yes. COVID hit in March. Mm -hmm. You know, so God has been kind to us. So the, the truth is that what I will say to persons who may be watching and who are, you know, a little hesitant and so forth, you have to bet on yourself. It's simple. You have to bet on yourself. You know, you can't really rely on, you know, too many people. But in the in the own silence of your own mind and your own being, you should be able to say, "Let me bet on myself." Because listen, if it doesn't work out, you bet on yourself. Exactly, exactly. You know I mean? yeah. Yeah. And it may just very well work out pretty well. Give <laughs> <laughs> that time. <laughs> um, Tisan says, "Very inspirational." Thanks for that comment, Tisan. Jermaine says, um, do smaller islands pose opportunities in real estate? No, ab absolutely. Um, the only challenge I will say is, and, you know, maybe I'm being a little too honest, there's still some level of, you know, abhorrence, you know, when you step in as a Jamaican to, into mm -hmm. some small, smaller islands. You know, they have, like, the guards up and so forth. But um, there are many opportunities in, in, in the region. Okay. And um, well, B bunk bunker mate asks, does it cost a bottle of signature blend to get a meeting with Mr. Ryan Reed? But um, Ryan, I'm sure you'll share some of your details. Mr. Reed, I think is a little more accessible. Yeah, no, very accessible, very, very accessible. accessible. And I can't um, be bought either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Craig Paul says, if you have cash and don't know what to do with it. 
do what our elders did put the money in the ground um jamaica is an island no more land being created so there's some people that are saying because you know there is a lot of talk about um money just unused money mm -hmm. people there is money in the market that people don't know what to do with. Yes. And there's some persons who are not sure of the investment opportunities and they're a little scared of what's happening yes. in time. And yes. they really will put it under their mattress. No, yes. what, what, what would your advice be to small businesses who have been able to pivot are now actually seeing their way and yes. are wondering about the investment opportunities available for, for their surplus? Well, the truth is that the first thing I'll say is contact a licensed investment broker, mm -hmm. you know, um, to give some proper advice. Um, the only advice I would give is um, do not put it on your mattress <laughs> because um, the house may burn down. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, Laura Ward, I see your question about financial um, institutions lending money for personal in, um, reasons and not for small businesses. We're mm -hmm. actually, we'll have the financial institutions um, talking about that. Um, yes short order so look forward to that so um coming out of the pandemic um, many businesses are considering just downsizing their commercial space as more people mm -hmm. are working from home mm -hmm. um, so a question for you now where that is concerned as we're thinking about investment mm -hmm. um what you are seeing and you did mention earlier you know, that it is a conundrum um, mm -hmm. as people are working from home. Should we be looking out there for, for opportunities to purchase commercial space or should we be moving, be moving away from commercial space? So the, 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 tru the truth is working from home will not, it's, it's not sustainable, oh. right? So, I mean, getting up and, you know, putting on, you know, just any old thing and going downstairs and, I mean, it's not sustainable because if you want to really be a global, you know, entrepreneur or professional, then it requires of you to get out. You know, whether you get to your office, you know, whether you know get to a, get into a boardroom, whatever it is. The truth is that may not be that the, the requirement at this time. But yeah. we, will, we will emerge from this pandemic and things will get to get back to you know how you know quasi what it used to be before this pandemic. What I will recommend to persons is just simply to be agile. Okay. Do not take a square position to say, okay, well, I'm not going back to my office ever. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it is, would you say it's a good time to invest in real estate generally? Well, it's always a good time to invest in real estate in my mind. You know, okay. um, you know, you know, like someone said earlier, you know, God is God isn't making any more land. You know what I mean? And <laughs> You know, there may be some artificial land which, you know, will come at like, you know, pricey levels, you know, but the truth is it has, it has proven to be, a, you know, very, you know, attractive, long-term sustainable asset. Yeah. And, um, and, and based on that, because I, I, I like how you put it, because there are some persons who were a little you know, skeptical about investment in, in, in these, in real estate investment companies, mm -hmm. but there is so much value and your ability to also scale up and, and out into yes. the islands. Yes. Um, so I will wrap up with this. If I, I want to get some more information to understand how this works, mm -hmm. um, who can I get in touch with first? Who can I speak to? So if if one of our viewers wants to understand, who do I speak to to understand how this really works? Because I want to get some more information. So firstly, what I would say is contact your licensed investment broker. Um, there, you know, there are many of them. You know, there's the you know baritas, the proven wells of this world, um, the signals of this world, who will give you proper guidance. Um, you know, I would you know I would expect and you know certainly hope that the recommendation will point towards first our capital holdings you know primarily because of our far reach and our diversification okay and and we'll put um shortly in the comments the contact information for for first rock um so thank you very much ryan i see a message here from a, a question here from june mcleod why are those properties so expensive june i want you to hold that question because we have more people coming who can't answer that question so yeah. ryan, thank you very much for taking some time to join us tonight on thank COVID. You,
and we're looking forward to have you again. Thank like you. I was saying, you 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 not only provided some some in, some insight on real estate investment, but you dropped some gems on them. Drop some gems. Thanks a lot, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Bye. So, viewers, as we promised, we do have tonight is 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 filled with experts in various areas of real estate, and um. As you know, COVID cast is brought to you by Private Sector Organization of Jamaica. You're able to view our episodes on the YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook, and please download the memos. This week's memo is exceptional. In fact, it was crafted through Coldwell Bankers by Gillian Black, who is our next guest. Ensure that you email us at sme at psoj.org. And COVID cast is brought to you. We are able to provide these episodes to you every week through the courteous sponsorship of the NCB group and the JMMB group. And they will be joining us too in the next few weeks as we're talking about real estate investments and opportunities. Now, at this time, we're gonna welcome Gillian Black, who is a realtor with Coldwell Banker, Jamaica Realty, one of Jamaica's most recognized and well-respected real estate brands. This year, Coldwell Banker celebrates 20 years in the business led by broker Andrew Issa. Gillian has seven years of real estate experience helping clients to buy, sell, and lease real estate island-wide, both residential and commercial. And COVID-19 has in fact had a widespread impact on all things, including real estate. So today, Gillian is going to be talking to us a little bit about the current real estate markets, opportunities for investment for individuals in residential and commercial and let me tell you when you download memo you will understand why we had to have Gillian on welcome Gillian thank you for taking the time with us today hello Rochelle thanks very much for having me thanks for inviting me PSOG where I'm very excited to be here and Coa Banker is very excited to be here to talk to your viewers about real estate which is what we love and what we want to do here in Jamaica so you are kind of at the epicenter of, of what is happening in real estate in Jamaica. Yes. And mm -hmm. let's start out with a snapshot of, of some of the trends that we've seen over this, this unprecedented year. Okay. Um, what are we seeing happening in the market? Um, what are some of the observations you've made? Okay, well, sure. Um, certainly, you know, when we first were hit by COVID-19 in March and April, and there was that great deal of uncertainty, you know, you did see that lull. But the fact is that real estate is so connected to our day-to-day -day lives as individuals and as businesses that the real estate market is it's very resilient. It just, there's always a lot of activity. People still need to buy something. They still need to sell something. They still need to rent something. If you thought your space was too much and you're giving it up, you no, know, you need to downsize. You need to find something else. So it, there is, we all use real estate in different ways. And so through COVID, perhaps we have changed how we have used real estate or what real estate we need. But the fact is we still need real estate and so we still pursue different opportunities and activities in real estate throughout this entire time and continuing now. Okay. So I would say that right now the market is very active mm -hmm. um, and certainly there are different opportunities and there has been different impacts. So for instance in commercial you know you have instances where you know, people are working from home. So some businesses are, the floors are not as occupied as before. There's more loose capacity in terms of floor space and that sort of thing. But we do expect those to come back. But as a result, you know, you do have opportunities to pick up a property for rent at perhaps a lower rental rate than you would have prior to COVID in a prime area. Um, and so, so that is an, an opportunity that is there. So in the residential market, likewise, because we probably have not has had as many expats at, at different times during the pandemic, you would have had a chance to say, you know, pay less for um, a brand new asset or mm -hmm. for something that now appeals to you more because you need more space at home, especially like with the home office, and you're now actually able to get 
one bedroom more for the same price that you're paying right now for two. So realist, the, the pandemic has caused us to kind of rationalize um, our real estate needs and to fine tune what we need and what we should be paying for it. Okay. In so, one respect. So real estate is is still. Um, we heard what Rand talked about real estate as as a still a great investment. What are your views on that? Absolutely, real estate is always a great investment because, as Rand had said, it is a tangible asset. It's also a tangible asset that I can have here and pass to my children, um, and so they can get value from it. It's an asset that I can live in. We're all at home, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's when it's curfew, but um, we should all be at home by now or on our way there, right? So you're, you're, we're, not, we're not outside in the air. We are physical people. We are inside a property. So we all want to go home to something in the evening. We can use real estate in our work as a productive asset. This is where we make the products that we are going to sell. So there is a utility to real estate, and it enables us to make money. Mm -hmm. And... One, another great thing about real estate is it provides a regular monthly return to rental income. Whether you as an individual have purchased an asset, like I may have purchased an apartment, or whether I own a business and I'm subletting some of my space and I am using some of that rental income to pay for uh, my mortgage and actually, in effect, help me to pay my asset. Mm -hmm. So there is that income component that you get monthly and you can't forget that long term you every month that you're paying for your asset you are increasing your ownership in that asset until you pay off that mortgage and you come 100 percent over and over the time you get the most returns out of real estate the longer that you keep your asset right. um, over time we expect that once you have chosen really good real estate the value of that asset should increase over time, which will allow you to realize a capital gain when you sell that asset, which is actually getting a lump sum or um, your built-in profit from owning that asset over time. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's of value today in what I can earn from it daily in income. It's, in, it's of value tomorrow for what I can sell it for and get a profit, a lump sum profit. So, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer. We want some of it. In our life, whether personal or business, and um, in terms of what we are seeing as some of the ways businesses can invest in real estate, yes. Um, and Joan, I'm seeing your comments. We're going to get to that shortly. Joan has some commentary about the the, the types of 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 of, uh, of residential accommodations that are available. We want to, we see a lot of high end looking apartments going up. You know what happened to the middle income ones, but we're going to get to that, Joan. So, mm -hmm. um, Gillian, what are mm -hmm. some of the ways that businesses can invest in in real estate? Okay, well, what what you can do is you can you can buy land, which you could develop at a, at a later date or now, and you know make that your business home or um, rent it out. You can buy offices, let's say, for example, which you can stop paying rent and you can move in there and you can um, produce and build and generate your business income in that asset. And you can also um, have an asset where you're both in it and operating as well as renting a portion of it to 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 gain to gain income um that's what you can do so that so that is an ownership aspect and there's also you know a rental aspect you can also determine whether um it makes sense to buy right now because maybe the rental rates for the type of property that you would like to be in you can't really afford it right now but you're like oh my gosh but i would i would love to, to operate out of a location like this because it's so visible and here it is and it's for rent and it's for rent at a good rate a, a little bit discounted because we are still in a pandemic yeah. right and people are looking for good tenants who will honor their rent obligations um, over the entire duration of their lease yeah. so it is a good time certainly for people that that want to rent to really um, review the market and see if there is a great product out there that will really enhance their business at this time. Yeah. So there is, an, and I like how you put it because there's case for rental. Um, yes. Of making the move from 
a, a, a way, a, a, mm -hmm. a kind of calculation that one needs to do to determine, well, at this rental, it actually makes more sense than the purchase. When, when I think some of the things that you can look at um, are, you know, can I pay the mortgage? Um, can I pay the mortgage for what I would like to buy right now? And do I have enough deposit um, in order to put down and do, uh, uh, and do I qualify actually even for the mortgage? Mm -hmm. Depending on the stage of the business, because we are looking at small businesses, you might not quite be there yet. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to get there. It just means that probably you need to say, um, well, how much savings do I have? How much does the kind of asset that I want to buy cost? You know, um, let me talk to a realtor to see if I can understand, um, you know, based on where I want to be, what does it cost to be there? And then you might say, well, we're going to need to talk to a mortgage specialist as well, because let's say if we identify something, how much does it cost to carry this mortgage? Am I there yet? Can I carry this mortgage? But there might be something on the rental market that is comparable to what you want to buy, but it's more affordable. So in the short term, you might decide, well, I will rent it. Um, you might also have businesses that are in a kind of, um, to talk about agility and flexibility, that are in a very agile phase right now. COVID has caused them to think about, well, do I need as much space? You know, can we actually have a lot more online presence and use less real estate? You know, I think we want to invest more in our business, whether that is in machinery or technology to really expand those aspects. So maybe right now I won't buy the real estate, but because I expect to get really profitable from how I'm going to invest in my business. And if nothing else, COVID has brought about a time where people realize that they have to be introspective and invest in their business. Big businesses, that is what they are doing. They are looking inward to say, well, this has been a hit. This is unexpected. Um, how do we adjust? What can we do better to be more resilient, to be more productive? And maybe for that production to even cost less than what we had envisioned because we're just now forced to think about how to be productive in a different way. So it's kind of like realigning your train of profitability in a way. Um, and so, you know, while it may appear like nothing is going on or we're in a lull right now, you're actually laying a great foundation to be profitable in the future to spend on real estate in terms of ac acquiring your own real estate. Yeah. I see Jazeel. Jazeel says businesses may also lease and or buy land to develop a special economic zone. Thank you for that comment, Jazeel. Um, Joan is asking, a one-bedroom apartment no renting for US 1200 to 2000 per month, are you saying they would be renting for more? Who are the persons renting at those prices? There are lots of people renting at that, prices, that price. And there are lots of people renting at more than that price. And there are lots of people renting at less than that price. You know, what we have to look at is rather than fixate on any one thing, know that it's a market and a market is made up of several things. Some cost more than others. And, and, let's, and let's also know that prices are negotiable. And even when you see prices that are quoted in US dollars, because um, rent landlords or sellers, they're often trying to hedge against devaluation. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will not be able to negotiate your rent in Jamaican dollars and pay your rent in Jamaican dollars. Yeah. Um, someone told me a long time ago, don't ask, don't get. So therefore, if you're looking at something that's in US dollars, there is no harm in saying, so will they take Jamaican from a great pain client? And that answer may very well be yes. So mm -hmm. it, 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 that can convert to Jamaican. Um, you just have to find out. And um, I'm seeing Nicola says, outside of the construction material costs, what exactly is driving the inflation in real estate costs, especially in Kingston? Does it come down to just demand and supply? Uh, well, I think um, Kingston is really the hub and epicenter or one of the major hubs and epicenter of business and life in Jamaica. Um, like Ran and some of our guests have said, you know, real estate is infinite and our population is growing um, and businesses grow by expanding, um, you know. So basically, yes, there is that element of um, supply, but prime land costs more and it costs more over time and therefore it costs more to acquire just the base product to then make it into something and as a result the dollar value that 
people will tend to pay for something is that is prime for sure is going to increase over time, which is why people say get in. You know, many people say it does hurt to buy real estate. You know, there's some sacrifice. There is, you know, less vacations, less dresses, less shoes. It can be, but it's, it's a short term pinch that is worth it in the long run to get an asset that you're going to secure at today's price and um, and have it increase in value over time. And likewise with new construction, yes, the prices are high now, but those prices are actually um, based on locally on inputs like steel, which has been increasing in price um, throughout the pandemic. Um, that things that were purchased at a lower price, let's say a year ago or pre-ordered a year ago and so. So luckily some of the real estate that started construction two years ago that are on the market for sale now are actually at potentially better, better prices than um, a new development that is going to be issued today that is going on the market for sale that they haven't broken ground or started construction yet just because the inputs in that product cost less than what today's inputs are now going to cost. Yes. It's good if you can find a match of something on the market now that suits your pocket, suits your long-term interests, um, and that you can afford to go for it. And you can go for it by yourself. You can team up and go for it with friends. Um, as we talk about small business, a lot of people are have friends groups, and they have like-minded friends who are interested in the same passions of business, real estate, and investment. And they join forces and say, you know what? Um, I, I want to. I want us to build our our own few va vacation cottages or whatever it is. Let's go buy a, a piece of land out in Saint Thomas or or in Saint Anne. Let's look for it. We're not necessarily going to find it today. You know, it might be more long tail. But or they say, I want you know, let's pull together and build a warehouse. Let's pull together and um, and build a little office place or build four apartments and let's sell two and we keep two on rent. Um, mm -hmm. You, you, we can combine. It's not just a, a solitary road. Yes. And so there's that collaboration that sometimes collaboration. Collaboration. with real estate, we're so focused on getting it ourselves. Yes. Yeah. And Melton, hi Melton. Melton says, um, is asking for Gillian to explain the realtor's role within this process. Unlike in the US where my dealings are primarily with an agent and broker, Jamaica is quite different where only at the initial stage I communicate with an agent, but beyond that, all the dealing is with an attorney. I don't know if um Gillian can answer the why, but just generally, what is the role of the real estate okay. agent? So, I, so, so perhaps I'm going to explain, and I know that Natasha is coming on too, and we're yes. talking depth about that. We have an attorney coming on shortly. Yes. But, but pretty much I can say that as, as a real estate agent, Typically, a client will contact us and say, well, I'm interested in purchasing um, a piece of land or an apartment or a, a business office building, whatever that asset is. And so it's our job to try and hunt and find it at the location and um, within the budget of what the person is looking for. Um, it is our role to assist you with viewings. It is our role to, which is the setting up of the viewings. It is our role to assist you with putting in the offers um, negotiating the price or the purchase of this asset with the other realtors who may be representing the seller. Um, once you have an accepted offer, and during this process, we might actually need to help you find um, find a reputable lawyer. We might need to help you to find a reputable valuator, a, a reputable survey, or recommend a mortgage specialist to you. So pretty much a licensed realtor is your gateway to not only finding the real estate, but also ensuring that you make the right linkage, if you want to call it, with yeah. other professionals in the process that are going to help it run smoothly. So we kind of, for the most part, will get this thing under, get the property under offer, at which time we start our communication with the lawyer who will then be responsible for, for creating the draft sale agreement. Um, and at that point, um, there tends to be more negotiations or more discussions with the purchaser directly with their attorney. But you are going to need your realtor all throughout the process to help answer questions about the property and help to liaise you with other specialists during the process until the time of your completion. Yeah. Because I know sometimes people, because our process does involve a legal aspect to it and their lawyers, yes. lawyers, your lawyers. Mom, That's always recommended. 
Yes, but it um, there is value in actually seeking the expertise of a, of a licensed real estate agent, realtor to to provide that gateway. And even as we're looking for property and as we're looking to invest, that the realtor is able to be that leg for you to actually mm -hmm. go and and find property. And as well, a good realtor is going to have several years of experience. So you have come here for the first time today, perhaps, to buy the type of asset that you want. We have been dealing with perhaps this type of asset periodically throughout our career. We know what are the pitfalls of this type of asset. We might know something about this location. We might be able to give you some advice about what other people do and what they have done. So there is a wealth of knowledge that goes into the package of providing um, competent real estate services, um, which you can seek through a licensed realtor on a reputable real estate firm. Yes. So, um, you know, I've been seeing in the comments that lots of people have been saying great information, Gillian, because you've really given us a breadth of information on real estate. But as we are wrapping up, um, what advice would you leave with our viewers? Um, I would I would advise um, I would advise the viewers to to as I said be introspective and see where it is how they are using real estate now think about their their business plans in the in the current time and in the medium to long term to see where real estate fits in to that program for their um, for the production of their business and as well to provide an income to kind of offset the acquisition of of the real estate i definitely believe that real estate is a, an extremely important asset um, in terms of getting income diversifying your portfolio and at the end of the day once you pay for it nobody can take it away from you and it's just the most rewarding feeling to know that you um, drive by your building or you own your own business and you own the building that it's in and you're also giving back to other business people by helping smaller business people to provide them with rentals as well mm -hmm. and guidance in how to do it um so you know it's all part of a, a cycle a very important um cycle okay thank you really so well yes and 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 i think a, a great point that you made earlier was the collaboration as yes. in many instances we don't think of that wider collaboration mm -hmm. but thank you very much Gillian. Gillian is a licensed realtor with coldwell banker jamaica realty and Gillian has kindly provided to us some extremely useful information that you can access by emailing us at sme at psoj.org. Our next guest, I see a lot of legal questions coming up, so we're with you. Our next guest is Natasha Rick Rickards-Ball, who is a partner and attorney at law at Mars Fletcher and Gordon. She was admitted to practice in 2012, and she joined the, the firm as a member of the litigation department practicing employment law. She transitioned to pro property and probate and now has an expansive practice area, which includes conveyancing public auctions and private treaty sales for one of Jamaica's largest commercial banks, real estate developments, and estate planning. Natasha actually has two degrees from the University of the West Indies, a Bachelor of Laws and Bachelor of Arts in History and Political Science, both with upper class honors. And she is an active member of the Jamaica Bar Association and a member of the Conveyancing Committee. Natasha, Natasha, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for having me, Rochelle. Thanks for inviting me to this POJ's useful seminar. So Natasha, the questions are coming in rapidly. And you know that big question that people, do you really need a lawyer when you're purchasing real estate? It's a big question and I'm glad you're asking that question. And many people have been asking that question and the answer is absolutely. Um, whether you're a business or an individual, having a lawyer to represent your interests is the biggest and most important investment you can make. Um, real estate is one of the most expensive single transactions people will encounter during their lifetime. And there are many pitfalls. Um, and in order to protect yourself and just ensure that you get value for what you're paying for, a lawyer, as well as other professionals, like a good realtor, evaluator, surveyor, is of, it's very imperative, is of significant importance. Mm 
Yes. It can go either really well or really terribly. So yes. having a lawyer would steer it in the right direction for you. So you, you have well done well in litigating the case for why we do in fact need the lawyers. And um, if you can tell us a little bit about the process, because a lot of times as persons are doing their first real estate transaction, um, especially where mortgages are involved, that, that mm -hmm. some people aren't aware of just the various steps. You mentioned valuators, that there are valuations involved, that their mortgage company attorneys outside of your own purchase, outside of your own attorney. There are all kinds of costs associated. Um, can you just give us a little walk through with some of the things for first time um, purchasers that they should bear in mind for the process of purchase? Okay, so when you're purchasing a property for the very first time, obviously you have to identify the property, that's where the realtor would come in, um, ensure that it's something that you like, and quickly engage the services of an attorney, because this attorney will not only assist you with negotiating the terms of the contract, but protecting your interest by verifying the ownership of the property, ensuring that you're buying from the person who really owns the property, We've seen a lot of cases where people say, I own the property, it's mine to sell. And in fact, it's really a relative or they don't own it at all. Um, and they've collected your deposit and it's very difficult to get it back. Um, so the lawyer would conduct due diligence, ensure the property is free from encumbrances and liens that will affect you from actually getting the property transferred. Yeah. Um, Go on, uh, for those who, for those of us who don't know, what are encumbrances? So, for example, I was going to say that you may buy a property for a particular use. So, let's say you see a piece of land and you want to buy the property to build a commercial building. Yes. Um, the title, which the lawyer will scrutinize and read, will have a list of things that we call restrictive covenants, which is basically agreements between the neighbors setting out what you can cannot do with the property mm -hmm. um and in those situations right away your lawyer would be say be able to say to you listen you want to buy this property for commercial it has a modification that prohibits commercial development and only allows residential development mm -hmm. similarly if you want to go in the practice of development and you're buying a land with the aim to develop it there may be a covenant on the title that restricts multifamily development. So it's important for you to look on the title, look on the encumbrances, look on the caveats, any liens at all. I mean, they may have simple liens like a mortgage that the, the seller will have to discharge in order to be able to transfer. You need to have somebody to follow with that seller to ensure that you know, the person has discharged their obligations with the bank and that when you pay your money, you will be able to get a title in your hand and they're not still owing the bank money, extra money on top of what you paid them, which will prevent them from transferring it to you. So there are a lot of issues that can occur, which people take for granted. They just see the property. They just want to get it. It may be a good price. They may be being rushed by a vendor who says, oh, I have millions of other offers so if you drag your feet you're going to lose it but again it's a very important significant and costly investment that you need to ensure your rights are protected yes and i see nick roy barrett thank you for this question so nick roy says what about the person who ha who has cash and, and, and is, is wants to do a straight cash purchase. Because I think sometimes when people are doing a straight cash purchase, they think, well, we don't necessarily need to go through all of this lawyer business. Yeah, those are the persons that need the most protection because unlike um, an investment or acquiring a property by getting a mortgage, the mortgage company will have their checks and balances. So there's no getting our own not providing a valuation, not getting a survey or ID report, not having a lawyer. With a cash sale, you can simply pay your cash and get the title. And that is when you are most at risk mm -hmm. because it's not only about paying the properties, ensuring for the properties, ensuring that you pay for what you get. So mm -hmm. you have to understand the role of each professional, right? So the valuator, for example, 
will give you an idea of what the reasonable market value is. So you know whether you're getting a deal or you're paying an exorbitant amount of money for a property that you could have paid significantly less for. The surveyor, they will go to the property and ensure what is on the title reconciles with what is existing on earth mm -hmm. and whether or not there are any boundary issues with the property, etc. Now, if you rush off and purchase a property with cash and there are these issues, you will end up in a situation where if you decide to resell the property, you may have tremendous difficulty because there are a lot of encroachments or there are breaches that have to be modified before you can transfer the property. So persons with cash tend to want the transaction to be done very quickly and they just want to pay and get their assets but they are the most susceptible to risk um, because the checks and balances aren't mandatory. And yeah. so you have to have a lawyer to go through the agreement to ensure your rights are protected and to encourage you and explain why these checks and balances are very important, especially in those circumstances. Yes. Um, Chevy, Chevy asked how to become a realtor. So Chevy, we're actually having an episode on that. So please stay tuned to COVID cast. Jermaine asks, do you still trace the root of title or does Jamaica have a registered system of land ownership? Yes, we do have a registered system of land ownership. There are two types of ownership that exist in Jamaica. You have unregistered land and we find unregistered land mostly featured in the rural areas where land is passed on from generation to generation. My grandfather lived here, then I lived here, then my family is living there and a title is never obtained. Um, mm -hmm. though that's unregistered land. And with unregistered land, you will have to prove ownership. So you'd have to trace the root title back to 30 years in some instances to um, substantiate or to support your ownership of the land. Then you have the other sets of properties which are registered and they have a title for it. And Simply how you verify ownership is simply looking on the title and ensuring that the person who says they're the owner is actually the owner endorsed on the title. And yeah. you can get this information. It's public. It's available. You can go to the National Land Agency and do your own title search by giving them the volume and the folio number, for example, and they will print the updated title for you. So you'll be able to trace the ownership and to confirm and verify that the person you're in dealings with is the actual owner. Okay. So, um, Natasha, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people will watch, like, you know, cable TV and they're watching HGTV and they see the people go to house hunters and they walk around and they see the house and 30 days later, 30 days later, the family is happily in the home. They've moved in. The dog is in, cat is in, everybody's in and they're great. And, and they're saying to themselves, but then why why does it take so, so much longer than 30 days in Jamaica? And can a, 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 a transaction actually take 30 days in Jamaica? Well, first of all, House Hunters and HGTV are all staged, by the way. Um, so <laughs> it's not that quick. Um, however, Yes, we do have a problem where the transactions in Jamaica takes longer than 30 days, even if it's a cash sale. Um, it's mm -hmm. possible to get it done when things are all agencies and um, government bodies and the attorneys on each side are, you know, firing and doing what they have to do in a timely manner. But in land transactions in Jamaica, we rely heavily on national land agency which is a government entity and we have to go through our tax administration office which is another government entity and the checks and balances both places take a while um, and you do have to do your own due diligence so that takes up some of the time negotiating the terms of the contract may take up a little bit of time but it is possible when you have a cash sale now, yeah. if you get in a mortgage, that's completely different because the mortgage institutions tend to take a little longer because they have way more checks and balances. Um, you have to do your mortgage applications separately, wait for them to be comfortable, approve your application, issue an undertaking, and all of that takes a while. And then it even takes 
there's a time period for disbursement of the mortgage. So that all adds up and you find that this process is longer than we all want it to be. Um, especially if you're going through National Housing Trust, you know, the volumes are very high. So you have all of those things contending with, and as a result, the transactions are longer um, than we really want them to be. But hopefully we're getting there. Our title's office is working on projects now. They want to now digitalize titles and have the process much quicker. So it's taken us a while to get there, but we're heading in the right direction. The right direction. And um, just to remind us of some of the um, the taxes and fees that are are um, that we will encounter in property purchase. Okay, so many people, especially first time owners, have it in their mind that once they have the purchase price together, they're good. And Apart from the purchase price, there are a lot of other costs associated with the transaction. Um, I'm going to talk about the purchase a little bit more because they are the ones that have to come out of pocket, right? Most of the money for on the vendor's side will come from the proceeds of sales. So I'll talk about both, but specifically the emphasis will be placed on purchasers. So as a purchaser, apart from your purchase price, you're going to have to pay stamp duty. Now, stamp duty, fortunately, mm -hmm. has been reduced. At one point, it was 4% of the purchase price. Now, it's only $5,000. And that $5,000 is split between the vendor and the purchaser. So as a purchaser, you'll be responsible for $2,500. You'll also have to contribute to registration fee to register your, to effect the transfer and register, endorse your name on the title as a new owner. Um, that is 0.5% of the purchase price. And as the purchaser, again, you'll pay half of that. So it, mm -hmm. essentially, you will have 0.25% to be paid. Um, there are other miscellaneous costs that are normally in the agreement for sale when you get it. So one of the um, costs that always surprise people, even though it is very normal and usual, is that cost to pay the attorney that actually drafted the agreement separate from the cost you're paying your mm -hmm. own representative. Um, and that can vary from attorney to attorney. Um, you also have a cost to give the letters of position, that's what we call them, where the, the letters to the utility companies confirming that you're the owner, um, letters to the association, letters to whoever it concerns, the property management, there's a cost for that as well. So you have to read the agreement. In new construction, yes. you have other costs, um, especially when you buy an off the plan and it's pre-construction, you have costs, your share as a purchaser for preparing bylaws and titles, things like that. So again, when you approach your attorney with a agreement, they should be able to provide you with an estimated statement of account. Mm -hmm. um, that will give you an idea of the legal, the cost on the legal side of things. Yeah. And of course, if you're getting a mortgage, there is a whole other set of costs related to the mortgage process that you'll have to pay. Um, and it's good to get a breakdown of that as well. And if you have, as we had discussed before, if you get an evaluator, which mortgage companies require, you're going to have to pay the evaluator, pay the surveyor, Pay the, the vendor is responsible for the payment of the realtor, but the, you would have to pay your own legal fees as well. So bear that in mind. It's not just the purchase price. It is the overall cost of the transaction. And as a rule of thumb, we used to say budget 20% out of pocket um, for your costs, for your deposit and closing costs. Mm -hmm. And that may change a little because you know that deposit, some people now accept 5% versus 10%. Financing yeah. can go up to 97%, in some cases, even 100%. But you must have mm -hmm. more than just the deposit when you are preparing to purchase property. The purchase, yes. Very important. And of course, Nicola does ask the question, what is the average legal fee? 
Well, the average legal fee for real estate transactions is normally fixed and it's normally a percentage, right? So it varies um, and it will depend on the cost of the, the sale price, the purchase price, your attorney, etc. But I would say on average, just on average, it'd be between 1% to 3% of the sale price. Um, again, that can vary and it will really be a negotiation between you and your attorney. Yes. Um, Alistair says um, the, he wishes that he could have seen the first part. And Alistair, we did respond to say that it, the episode, the full episode will be available on Facebook. It will also be on YouTube and on smallbusinessportal.com. Um, I see Milton asking about um, an infraction. And um, and then I see Andrew Lee asking, what's the process for getting restrictive covenants modified? So I think it's the same type of question. So I'm going to take the two, these two, this this question about removing, um, having modifications done, and removing restrictive covenants. And Gia Bryce, I did see a question about subdivisions. Now, Natasha, you're making the people them ask the question. Great, great discussion. Thank Good you. way to get free legal advice with this seminar. <laughs> <laughs> so what right. is that process for modifications? Okay, so as I said earlier, on the title, there are lots of provisions which tells you what you cannot do with the property. And the reason it's there is to benefit your neighbor. So... Um, for restrictive covenants, if you want to modify it, and the modification process, a lot of it, the most common type of modification is boundary modification, where on the title, for example, it would say um, the entrance should not be more than five feet from the border of the property, and your the property that you're purchasing is actually three feet. Um, and you can't hit down the building, the front of the property, so to have yeah. it conform with the covenant. So you'll apply to the court to have it modified. So you'll get an attorney to put in that application for you. It's done by what we call a fixed date claim form. And it's served on all the interested parties, mm -hmm. which would include your neighbors, the local planning authority, and NIPL. And you would have to propose what you intend to modify. So you would, it ha would have to be very clear to the court and the interested parties what your intention is to modify um, and those interested parties have the opportunity to object if they find that your application for the modification may affect them adversely mm -hmm. so the process is a court application um, normally done in our firm it's done by our litigation slash conveyancing department and it involves a court application the service of the notices um, you'll have to get a surveyor's ID report, of course, to show the modification and other documentation. And the process itself can take, we normally tell clients at the very least six months because it takes a while to get everything going, to get a date for hearing, to serve the interested parties, etc. But again, it's a very common, very, very common um, thing that is done. And for distance breaches, it tends to be a little bit more easier to get the court and the interested parties to agree, especially when the breach has been there for a very long time. Very long time, yes. Um, so, yes. So, again, the lawyer would be able to identify it. If you're getting a mortgage, they say that there is a breach of covenant. They will not disperse until they are satisfied that the covenant can be modified, will be modified, or there's an attorney making an application to modify things. Okay. Thank you for that, Natasha. And um, I think this subdivision question could come. Um, could you just give us just some high-level um, guidelines on persons who are seeking to subdivide land? Because, you know, you do have people with large parcels of land and are seeking to, to make some additional money by doing subdivisions. What's that general process like? Okay, so you would have what you call a parent title, so the title for the entire parcel of land. And if you want to cut it up, you have to apply for subdivision approval, which means that you will have to get a survey of the area, indicate how you want to apply, 
send it to the relevant authority, local authorities. They will see it, they will assess it, and they will tell you whether or not it can be done. So the sur the survey or the subdivision approval or the application will have conditions. For example, it will tell you you need to install a roadway so each lot will have access. You need to ensure that there is water flowing um access for those things so they will vet the application mm -hmm. they may reject it because not all subdivision applications are accepted it depends on the size of the land how you plan to cut it off or they may conditionally approve it where you will have to do certain things before you can get the approval once the approval is received you will just lodge your parent title with the titles office along with the relevant documents and they will have that parent title and splint, produce multiple titles for each lot that has been subdivided. Okay. So that's generally the process in a nutshell. Okay. And um, Leslie actually had asked about property that is left for three persons, whether or not you can get it surveyed individually if the other persons are, are not ready. And I think you can just pay to get that property surveyed. Yeah, absolutely. So is yes Even it transferred is another is, issue uh, you won't be able to get that done without their consent but you can survey without their consent um mm -hmm. adverse possession is is something else that has come up a lot um what is adverse possession for those persons who don't know because sometimes we're talking about it but we're not so sure what is it what is adverse possession so the inf I know people may not know the term adverse possession, but they'll surely know the term squatters. <laughs> so basically it's where the paper owner for the property has abandoned their property. So they don't live on it. They don't take care of it for a period of more than 12 years. And you have somebody living on the property or may not be living on the property doing acts of ownership, which could mean planting vegetables, securing it, taking care of it for a period of 12 years, and they will be able to apply for title by way of adverse possession without any reference to the paper owner. Um, and it's a process whereby you made application, needs to be supported. So there are statutory declarations need to be obtained for people that know the land, that can vouch for the adverse possessor to say that yes, they have been the one taking care of it, doing dealing with acts of ownership, and they've been doing it for a specific period of time, which is mandated by the law. Yes. And if it is approved and vetted by what we call the referees of title, then you can, the adverse possessor, the squatter, can get a title issued in their name and completely disregard the paper owner as the formal paper owner as the owner of the land okay so it's you. a serious serious yes. thing so, and we always encourage people especially persons that live overseas and may have land here have the land fence to check up on it even a little sign yes. saying no, no trespassers. trespassers or something will always help a claim to um again Coming here, because you know, if mm -hmm. we said dog, we bite you. Yes, beware of bad dogs. You know that somebody owns it. Yes. Um, Kevin actually asked an interesting question. Um, and this is we're going to take this as the last question because, viewers, this is the first in a series on real estate. So you have to join us every week. We're going to be looking at stratas. We're going to be looking at um at I see Babita asking a question about someone who died several years. We'll be answering. So we're going to be going back through to see some of the areas that you want us to discuss. So you had need to be joining us every week. Um, earlier, um, Gillian had mentioned collaborating for property purchase. So Kevin asks, is there a legal limit for the amount of persons that can purchase land or property together? Um, that's a good question, actually. I don't know why 50 persons is coming to my mind, but I'm not actually sure if there is a legal limit. I would have to definitely verify that. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking 50 persons. Yeah. Um, but again, Kevin, who I know very well, I will <laughs> verify that information and get back to you. 
and we will we'll provide that information to our viewers. Natasha, thank you so much for joining us on COVIDcast. It's been an excellent discussion. You've provided such great information. You know we're going to have to bring you back. The viewers have so much to ask, and, and you've been very, very clear. So thank you very much. Natasha rickards Ball, attorney at law, MF&G. She's actually a partner at MF&G and one of our convincing experts. Thank you very much, Natasha. Viewers, 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 wow, what an evening. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first in a series on real estate investment and opportunities. We know you have questions about stratas. How do stratas operate? I saw questions about how do you become a realtor? So we'll be looking at various aspects of real estate to demystify a lot of the things that we've heard about real estate. We're also going to have our partners um, um, NCB group, JMMB group, talking to us about mortgages, talking to us about investment opportunities. So we expect to see you here with us 7.30 p.m. on a Thursday as we go on this real estate journey. So our current series is a real estate journey, real estate investment and opportunities. And please email us your questions. Um, areas that you want to have covered. We'll go back through the questions to ensure too that we're covering the areas that you want to discuss. We encourage you to email us at sme at psoj.org so you will have access to our weekly memos because as you can see, they cannot be missed. If you're wondering, this is the first time you're joining us and you're saying to yourself, how could I have missed all of these 57 episodes before? Well, the NCB group and the JMMB group have partnered with us at private sector organization of Jamaica will also ensure that the episodes are available on smallbusinessportal.com. They're available on our YouTube channel. They're available on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram at PSOJ Financial Access JA. Ensure that you know what is happening every week. Or our memos are available on smallbusinessportal.com. So you're able to log on and download. And when you um, sign up, for our memos, you are able to get them weekly, then come to you with the reminder for our episodes. So we're looking forward to seeing you. We love the interaction. Please send in your questions. And we want to ensure that we are here and we continue serving you from the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica. We wish to give big thanks to our sponsors, the NCB Group and the JMMB Group. And we say, see you next week. Walk good sanitize wear your mask 7 30 pm thursdays covid cast ja see you again next week so you so you have a great idea to start a business but you don't know where to start we completely understand you have a lot of questions and almost no answers smallbusinessportal.com is here to help at smallbusinessportal.com, you gain access to information on loans, grants, and investment opportunities from verified financial institutions. Guess what you also get? Useful business tips, access to training. All these services combine to make your business idea into a reality. Start your journey today at smallbusinessportal.com.